morning, everyone. So we're going to get started. Hope you all are doing well during this election week. Uh, welcome to UPenn's new speaker series, Annenberg Conversations on Race. I'm Brandy Monk Payton. I'm an assistant professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. I will be moderating this exciting roundtable discussion entitled Situating the Kardashians Skin Theft Ops. The roundtable seeks to situate the Kardashian enterprise in a long US tradition of extracting and repackaging black cultural forms for mass white and violent consumption and highlight the particular harm their enterprise of white womanhood does to black women. Obviously the Kardashian empire has made an impact on the American popular imaginary. After 14 years and 20 seasons, Keeping Up with the Kardashians concludes with the final season airing on E! in early 2021, marking the end of an era of reality TV programming and celebrity culture. But it seems as if they will never quite leave the public eye, right? Even just last week, Kim's pandemic birthday party on a private island became a meme on social media. So I'm looking forward to what will be a really fascinating and timely discussion about race, gender, stardom, privilege and justice. I will briefly introduce our four panelists in the order that they will speak. Each panelist will be given about five minutes uh, to remark. Then we'll have a conversation afterwards and open it up to Q&A with the virtual audience. So please feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A function um, in this webinar to send in your questions. Dixa Ramirez de Oleo is Assistant Professor of American Studies and English at Brown University. Her first book, Colonial Phantoms, Belonging and Refusal in the Dominican Americas from the 19th Century to the Present, NYU Press 2018, received the 2019 Barbara Christian Book Prize from the Caribbean Studies Association. She is working on her second book, Blackness in the Hills and the Photographic Negative, which is under contract with Duke University Press. Ren Ellis Neira is the author of The Cry of the Senses, Listening to Latinx and Caribbean Poetics, Duke University Press, coming up December 2020. They are beginning two new book projects, Liquid, Unsovereign Caribbean Poetics and Chimerical Ecologies, and Abuse Poetics and the American Domestic. Wren is currently a John Carter Brown Library Fellow doing research on 18th century Caribbean maps of the Liquid book. They are an Associate Professor of English at Wesleyan University. Elizabeth Hinton is Associate Professor of History in African American Studies and Professor of Law at Yale University. She's the author of From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, which received the Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize from the Phi Beta Kappa Society and was named to the New York Times 100 Notable Book List in 2016. Hinton's articles and op-eds can be found in the pages of the New York Times, the Atlantic, the LA Times, the Boston Review, the Nation and Time. And finally, Vanessa Diaz is a multimedia ethnographer and journalist. Grounded in her experience as a red carpet reporter for People Magazine, Diaz's first book, Manufacturing Celebrity, Latino Paparazzi and Women Reporters in Hollywood, out now with Duke University Press, focuses on hierarchies of labor as well as racial and gender policies, politics and the production of celebrity focused media. Her research has been profiled in such outlets as The Atlantic, The LA Times and NBC News. Diaz is an assistant professor in the Department of Chicana and Latina Studies at Loyola Marymount University. So now the panelists will take it away. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us on this surreal day. <laughs> I'm very thankful uh, to be here uh, on Zoom, if not in spirit. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have um, a PowerPoint and I'll jump right in because we have only about five minutes each, five to seven. And I just want to say thank you to uh, the folks who made this possible today. Okay, the Kardashian-Jenner phenomenon in historical and hemispheric context. Kim Kardashian and others like her follow a long tradition of white women playing with the semiotics of the mulata or mulatres. And when I say these terms, please know that I'm saying them in quotation marks. Um, and this is an issue I discuss in chapter five of my book, Colonial Phantoms. Throughout the Atlantic slaveholding world, the so-called mulata, mulatres or mulatto woman became associated with sexual and sensual decadence. 
Focusing on the colonial French Caribbean, Doris Garraway writes that the idea of the mulatres was of a quote, colored Venus who cultivates beauty, sophistication, and sensuality for the purpose of seducing white men, and the libertine whose sole occupation was to perfect the art of pleasure, end quote. According to Jenny Sharp, the word mulatto was a generic term for concubines and could be used in relation to a black, quote unquote, mixed race, free or enslaved person. As such, argues Lisa Z. Winters, or Z. Winters, the term mulatta concubine became redundant. Indeed, the term mulatta was shorthand for a slaveholding society's view of black women, whether seen as racially mixed or not, uh, as wanton, hypersexual, and available. This knot of signifiers inverted the reality that white men could and did rape black women with impunity for much of this hemisphere's history. I would argue that in the Anglophone speaking world, this association between the term mulata and hypersexuality has almost entirely disappeared from the collective memory. But this is not the case in the Spanish speaking world. And I can't get into this right now, but I actually just wanna pull up some lyrics that I translated uh, from Salcedo Mark Anthony's song, Mi Mulata. And just FYI, this is one of endless numbers of songs that have similar language about the so-called mulata uh, in relation to sexual availability. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with Carlos Santana's version of Ojo Como Va, which was written by Tito Puente and which famously says, buena pagosa mulata, good for enjoying uh, mulata. So this is just extremely common in Spanish language music. Um, in contradistinction, white womanhood as a genre of the human to invoke Sylvia Winter's term was defined greatly by their sexual uh, and visual unavailability and their being cloistered except to the proper white patriarch. As much as she was a symbol of black women's sexual availability, the mulata as a sign was also in another sense, a hypersexual version of white womanhood. The mulata's home was metonymized by the silk laden bedroom. She was not imbued with domesticity. Instead, she occupied an indoors crudely available to the public. I would argue that the Kardashian-Jenner enterprise is itself based on how they play with bridging these two ideas of the enclosed white domestic sphere on one side and on the other of the wink wink sexualized bedroom domesticity of the sign of the mulata. In spite of their actual unfreedom or tenuous freedom, the association between mulatas luxurious material items and capital and sex was extremely threatening to a socio-racial economic hierarchy, whereby proper mar marriages between legally white persons protected and grew property and begat proper white heirs. Colin Dian cites the memoirs of white Creole woman, Laurette Emmet Mozart Nicodemi, who wrote from a late 18th century Port-au-Prince that fellow white elite women were quote, humiliated in their claims by mulatresses, femme publique, or public women. Even when not officially prostitutes, quote unquote prostitutes, public women alluded to the sense that free and enslaved black and mixed race women were available to the white public. Mozart Nicodemi continues that in the city of Cap, Quote, they issued an order that forbade this degraded class from wearing shoes. Mulatresses then appeared in sandals with diamonds on the toes of their feet, end quote. At the same time that black people's cultural expressivity and innovation has been perpetually curtailed by law and through violence, one of the benefits of whiteness throughout the hemisphere has been the ability to safely and without loss of whiteness as property, incorporate black, to incorporate black cultural objects into otherwise Eurocentric practices. White practitioners dabbling in local black cultural practices imbue them with avant-garde status in the higher brow version or extraordinary global popularity in the lower brow version. This mode of extraction and faux innocent sleight of hand persists to this day in Latin America as much as in the US, Europe and beyond. Zakia Jackson's concept of plasticity is salient here which she defines as, quote, a mode of transmogrification whereby the fleshy being of blackness is experimented with as if it were an infinitely malleable lexical and biological matter, end quote. Starting in the, and I'm wrapping up here, starting in the mid 20th century, white Latin American women were the ones who most often became symbols of Latinidad in the US, in US popular culture through their performances of caricatures of black Latin American and black Caribbean cultural practices. In this sense, it traffics in a semiotic mulataje. 
Consider Carmen Miranda, a white Portuguese woman who rose to global fame and maintains an iconic, even when ironic status through her adoption of Afro-Bahian women's cultural garb and the musical traditions of Salvador da Bahia. Her famed Tutti Frutti hat was an accessory which alluded to the West African, now African Latin American, Afro Latin American, Latin American cultural practice of carrying things on one's head. The hat is also a hollowed out reference to the history of enslaved and free Afro-Brazilian market women. What through Afro-Bahian women's bodies is necessity, forced labor, or at best folklore, through Miranda becomes a capitalist and fashion phenomenon. Consider also her white, uh, white Puerto Rican performer, Iris Chacon. Her prominent and bared ass graced respectable Latin American TV screens, especially in the 1970s and 80s. Preceding Chacon with the Rumbera performance, performers of golden age Mexican cinema who were white, usually Cuban born women, dancing a hypersexualized version of an Afro-Cuban genre. And the first slide showed um, a poster of such a film. Both Miranda and Chacon acquired the tacit, if not explicit approval of their national contexts as lower brow but appropriate ambassadors to national culture and as proper symbols that would make it seem as if these white supremacist, anti-Black and anti-Indigenous societies were actually commingled in happy union. Because even if these women themselves might not be racially mixed, whatever that means, not in any way that would prevent them from partaking in whiteness as property in either Brazil or Puerto Rico, their performances traffic in discourses of racial ambiguity and the long history of the mulata as sensual and sexual decadence. They do this through plasticity as defined by Zakia Jackson, whereby they can safely and playfully allude to blackness and sex without the weight of the law through which the children of enslaved black women were to become slaves themselves. As with the Kardashians, there is no black mother here. We must then ponder what it is that Kim and Chloe and Kylie and others like them do for the US national context at this moment in time. It might be helpful to see what her, their Latin American counterparts and predecessors did for Brazil, Puerto Rico and the popular ideas of US Latinidad. Thank you. Okay. Um, greetings. Um, I uh, recently had an essay published in uh, with Public Books um, called uh, "The Kardashians' Multiracial White Supremacy." Um, I'm going to evoke some of the language or reuse some of the language from that recent um, piece, but some of the writing that I'm sharing here is new. Um, so. Provisionally, I'm titling this um, Anti-Black White Matriarchy, The Specters of Robert Kardashian and Robert Houghton and Interracial Horror. Um, I do wanna note a caveat before I start reading and say that many things that I'm about to say uh, to my mind would be different if Donda West had not died where and how she did. Okay, open quote. I first want to say, Kim, I couldn't be happier for you. Kanye, I'm so obsessed with you, and I cannot wait to have you legally as a brother. I just cannot wait for this wedding. I am so excited. And let's have more kids, more babies. Close quote. So went Khloe Kardashian's toast to Kim's engagement to Kanye West in the 2014 season nine, episode five of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Her toast includes a reference to Baby North, who was born before the engagement. Her toast inadvertently reiterates Jared Sexton's arguments in amalgamation schemes, wherein the interracial relationship is, as he puts it, renovated as a family affair via multiracial children. Here, let me give you the, the whole familial effect. Okay, as time has passed, Kim, Chloe, and Kylie particularly have become masterful producers of raced visuality, both through interracial sex appeal vis-a-vis -vis partnerships with famous black men and simultaneously via white domesticity reproductive of 
Black as multiracial children. Through this combination, the Huffton Kardashian Jenner women enact patriarchy as matriarchy and propagate the phenomenon of what I'm calling multiracial white supremacy, by which I mean their whole racially ambiguous, nevertheless ancestrally white enterprise exists in service of the anti Black project of man, capital M. Theirs too is a whitening project, one which domestically involves Black people and Black objects. The Huffton Kardashian Jenner matriarchal capitalist empire is substantially constructed around Kim's white ass as hearth, as what anchors their do domesticity's lucrativeness and its beyond touchness. White matriarchy notably is ancestrally sanctioned by a white patriarch, be he visible or not. Whereas black matriarchy in the Americas, as Hortense Spillers writes about the Moynihan report in the US, is responsible for the black family's inability to uplift itself into the ranks of white uncivil society. In such a white supremacist understanding, black matriarchy is far more to blame than slavery and its hyperactive afterlife for the white pathologizing of black kinship. Black matriarchy in the, in the Western imaginary is disorder. In a black heterosexist imaginary, Kim's ass offers jiggles without black history, without the baggage of the black mother in the fiction of the Moynihan Report, which therefore frees Kim up to, in Spillers' terms, quote, willingly trade her body for a little piece of the patriarchal soul, close quote, and a large piece of the American pie. Spillers continues, to lose control of the body, which is to say gender's sexual meaning, is in the historical outline of Black American women often enough the loss of life, end quote. Kim's figure of white womanhood's constructed curves, on the other hand, is underwritten by white ancestry. Behold this horrible graphic of, of her white ancestry. Um, it's underwritten by white ancestry, domesticity, and property ownership. Her ass routes to an address in Calabasas, California, and to rewarded white settlers that begat her address. Her historical embodiment grants her capitalist chops and untroubled racial sexual schemas. Schemes, rather. The reality show and the empire it has begotten, like 19th century abolitionist and romantic literature, conveys white sentimentalism for Black objecthood, repackaged of late for sundry multiracial subject positions. The Kardashians have not innovated anything in this regard. They have stepped into a categorical place well prepared for them by the 19th century middle by 19th century middle class white womanhood. That era's idea of white womanhood, as Jasmine Nicole Cobb has argued, was obsessed with self-styling, posing, and selectively arranging black people and black objects visibly in rooms set for entertaining. Part of the Huffton Kardashian Jenner's extended parlor entertainment includes sex tapes, which circulate in the same domestic spaces and imaginary as an archive of home videos of the young Kardashian and Jenner children. That footage, which we see in scenes uh, of the show and the opening credits of Keeping Up With The Kardashians and on social media, and its 90s camcorder aesthetic emits a nostalgic baby-making aura. Juxtapose this with the viral Kim and Ray J sex tape, which bore her fame, which is the theme of the first episode of the first show of Keeping Up With The Kardashians, and which Kanye West raps about in various places, including his songs Highlights and Famous, repeating the resignification of Kim's sex therein as his, meaning Kanye's, and not Ray J's. However, I diverge from the lyricist's logic, and I want to underscore it is his because it is hers, Kim's. And it is Kim's because it is hers, which is to say Chris's. And it is Chris's moreover because it is his with a capital H, the domesticating and visible whitened patriarch, by which I mean both the racially ambiguous and non-black Robert Kardashian, who first dated Chris when she was 17 and he was 29, and also Chris Huffton's biological daddy, Robert True Huffton, the San Diego Air Force Base engineer, father of both Chris, AKA Kristen Mary Huffton, and her sister, Karen. 
it's not a metaphor. Her name is Karen. And also the namesake of Chloe's black child, True. Viewers of the Huffton Kardashian Jenners are bound to the empire of white domesticity and its love of what Saidiya Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery. Um, in the Q&A, I would be glad to discuss the hologram of Robert Kardashian that recently appeared and spoke to Kim on some unnamed island, spoke laced with Kanye West's lyrics in his voice, beatifying Kanye as the most, 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 I don't know how many most there were, genius man, and sanctifying Kim as what? a good mother. This haunting specter as hologram is scored by the narrative of normative multiracial family production. And as we have recently seen with Little Wayne's bizarre endorsement of Trump, uh, it's also um, scored with multiracial black and non-white white supremacy. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's Elizabeth. I don't, waiting for Ren to switch up. Um, first, I just wanna thank uh, Annenberg for, for hosting us. Um, everybody who made this possible, including my uh, co-panelist, Vanessa Diaz, who um, helped get everybody in line, Brandy for moderating, and of course, um, all of you for taking um, perhaps a break, um, but maybe it's not a break from everything else that's going on in the world to, um, to talk the Kardashians with us. Okay. Um, so I wanna start with a, um, with a brief clip courtesy of Vanessa. And let me also just say that um, my, that there's a little bit of a lag between the, the visual and the audio here. The audio is most important, but the visual kind of helps things. So um, I'll just start this. I, I recently went to a women's prison because I felt like, you know, I, I connected to this, but I don't have any personal experience. So I wanted to go and just kind of see for myself what the conditions are, what goes on. And I did feel bad. I mean, when they saw that I was there, they were like banging on the windows, like, Kim's here to get us out. <laughs> and they were like banging on the windows and like, get it. and I was like. Oh no, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. the liberator now. So did you notice um, how everybody laughed at the idea of incarcerated women, uh, many of whom no matter what prison Kim was visiting um, are serving time for nonviolent crimes or if they are there for violent crimes, are there because um, they were defending themselves against an abuser um, and the audience laughed at the idea of, of them seeing Kim as, as a vehicle for their freedom. Um, Kim Kardashian West tells us that, quote, there is a mass incarceration problem in the United States. And she is dubbed by some as the, quote, princess of prison reform or a liberator, as Jimmy Kimmel called her. Um, and in 2018, Kardashian West famously lobbied President Donald Trump to grant clemency to Alice Marie Johnson, a 63-year-old great-grandmother serving a life sentence for a first-time nonviolent drug offense. And ever since Kardashian West has made transforming the criminal justice system her very public mission, marking the first time that um, any Kardashian took a public stance on a racial justice issue after years of cultural appropriation. As Kardashian West explains it, quote, I'm raising four black children that could face a situation like any of the people that I help. So just to know that I could make a difference in my children's lives and their friends' lives and their children's lives by helping to fix such a broken system that is just so motivating for me. I'm not doing it for publicity, I really do care. There's a lot to unpack about uh, that statement, especially given the, the context of the, the role of the Kardashians and in, in terms of like white motherhood and family that, um, that Ren just talked about, but it also demonstrates just how little uh, Kardashian actually understands about um, the justice system in the sense that it is highly unlikely that her enormous social media platform, her reality television show, and a glossy documentary on Oprah's Oxygen Network to raise critical awareness about um, injustice in America, even if sometimes, right, um, Kim's, ad Kim's adventures in prison uh, may seem funny as we just saw to her audience. Um, I, I recently oops. went to a Sorry. women's prison. I want to show just another brief, um, I'm just getting this ready to queue up because it takes a little bit. Um, just another brief 
video that I'll talk over a little bit. But, um, so when we actually look at Kim's social justice commitments, there is something perhaps more sinister going on, right? For one, um, this work has been critical to building um, Kim's and her family's brand. So you can find tweets and Instagram posts calling for justice reform on um, Kim's platforms, on Kim's Instagram and Twitter, interspersed with advertisements, right, for the TV show and her shapewear collection. Um, and as Kim is raising awareness about these issues, right, she's always placing herself at the center. Every time she meets with Alice Marie Johnson or does anything in the justice world, it becomes a major photo op for her. So I just want to show this clip and um, it's kind of self-explanatory, so I won't set it up too much. Oops. It's Kim. Oh, hi, Kim. Oh, my God, Kim. This is so crazy. You did it. Oh, my God. We did it. I'm at a shoot, so I cannot cry. Oh, I'm already doing it. But this is so crazy. You did it. Oh, my God. I cannot God. believe we pulled this off. I can't believe it. You made this happen. There was no way this would have happened without you. Hello? Hi, it's Brittany. Hi, Brittany. Hi, Brittany. Hi, who's on? It's Kim and Sean. Sean and Kim and Jennifer. Hey, hey y'all. Okay, one second. I'm trying to take a deep breath so I don't jack this ball. Okay. I'm okay. 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 Miss Alice. Miss Kim. This is Kim. It's Kim. Hi, Kim. How are you doing? Angel, my war angel. I cannot believe it. We did it. We huh? we did it. What happened? We did it. You don't know? No, you don't know. You're oh. talking to the news. Oh my gosh, Alice. You're out. Yeah. He <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I thought you knew. Oh my God, the news just broke. The, pre the president just called me and he told me that um, that you are out. He signed the papers, it's been released to the press, everything. You're coming home. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a humongous moment. Somebody being told that they are being released from prison and that they're going to be able to go home and meet their grandchildren for the first time. But this ends up being something that's packaged completely around Kim. Kim is the person who ends up informing um, Alice Marie Johnson that that uh, that Donald Trump had granted her uh, clemency. And this clip was used as a trailer for whatever new season it was of Keeping Up With The Kardashians and featured on, um, on Kim Kardashian's Justice Project documentary. Um, so the news of Alice Marie Johnson's release became a plot twist and an advertising gimmick, something that Kim managed to fit in, right, in the middle of a photo shoot. So this was not like the center of Kim's day. This was like a side note thing that where Kim was taking a break after her makeup or whatever, um, with an exaggerated expression of sympathy and concern, um, as if Kardashian West is more proud of herself um, than anything. And again, you know, Johnson then is not the, the story of, of um, the injustice that Johnson faced and her release and the attorneys that we'll get to in a minute um, that, that made that release possible becomes a sideshow. Um, so by positioning herself as a champion and savior for incarcerated people, Kardashian West's work in this regard can be seen as another act of appropriation and extraction, which effectively erased from popular view the lawyers who were, some of whom were on the call, community organizers and activists who have worked to transform prison conditions and elevate criminal justice disparities for decades. Specifically, uh, Kim's, Kim's celebrity overshadowed the grunt work of black woman attorneys, Brittany, Brittany K. Barnett, who was on that call, and May Angelo Cody, who have been working tirelessly for years to help free or reduce the sentences of more than 40 people who were sentenced to life without parole in federal prison for non-violent drug offenses. And even beyond the erasure of, um, oh, sorry. I'm not good at this stuff. Okay, even beyond the erasure of black women's labor, um, 
uh, Kim Kardashian West and her husband, Kanye West, have become central figures in facilitating the Trump administration's courting of Black voters. And they've been critical in making Trump's white supremacy seem more cuddly, right? So Johnson, who would go on to become spokesperson for Kim Kardashian West's Skims shapewear line, was featured in Trump's Super Bowl ad aimed at Black voters and play, played a critical role at the Republican National Convention. And I just want to show you, um, I wasn't planning on this before, but I just want to show you a few quick clips from, um, from Johnson's remarks and, uh, and try to cut these down. And this will be really brief. Alex, good evening. I'm Alice Marie Johnson. I was once told that the only way I would ever be reunited with my family would be as a corpse. But by the grace of God and the compassion of President Donald John Trump, I stand before you tonight and I assure you, I'm not a ghost. I am alive. I am well. And most importantly, I am free. In 1996. All right, we're going to jump around here a little bit. Kept hope alive. When President Trump heard about me, about the injustice of my story, he saw me as a person. He had compassion and he acted. Free in body, thanks to President Trump, but free in mind, thanks to the almighty God. I couldn't believe it. I always remembered that God knew my name, even in my darkest hour but I never thought a president would. When I was released on June 6, 2008. All right, one more. Six months after President Trump granted me a second chance, he signed the First Step Act into law. We can it talk about that later. justice reform. It was and not. And it brought joy, hope, and freedom to thousands of well-deserving people. I Hallelujah! My faith in justice and mercy was rewarded. All right, we just need to hear the end of what, of what she has to say. Uh, I can't see that. Okay, there we go. Right by my story and your compassion will lead you to take action for those who are forgotten. That's what our president Donald Trump did for me. And for that, I will be forever grateful. God bless you. God bless President Trump. And God bless America. Thank you. So what's part of what's really significant about this speech is that this was the final message that the Trump administration and that the Republican National Committee wanted to deliver to the American people before the president spoke. So after, right after she said, God bless President Trump, this montage video was shown at the RNC, then Ivanka Trump uh, stepped on stage and then President Trump. So Alice Marie Johnson became really critical to setting up um, and introducing the Trump family and, and President Trump himself. So in this sense, Kim Kardashian West um, and, and Kanye West, I have another, ah. okay, wait. Um, and Kanye West, who's in the MAGA hat hugging Trump below, um, are the handmaidens of white supremacy and the Trump administration, a relationship forged through Kim Kardashian's uh, friendship with Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. Um, and they share responsibility for where we are right now in this moment. Their actions and their advocacy for their own self-profit have actual material consequences for us. This is not just about a reality TV show and Instagram posts. This is, this is the kind of advocacy that is a danger to the world and that undermines struggles for freedom everywhere. Even as on the surface, Kardashian West at least appears to be propping these struggles up. So I know I've, I've gone over um, I'll end there, thank you. All right, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, 
thanks so much for being here. And uh, thank you to the Annenberg staff who helped organize this. I'm, I'm Vanessa Diaz. Um, you all can see my slideshow right now. Can I give a thumbs up? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, for me, as someone who has worked in the celebrity media world as a reporter and as someone who has spent years researching it, um, part of what I emphasize um, is really um, what Elizabeth was just saying. I wanna emphasize um, and and you know what others have demonstrated through their analysis is how in one of those instances, and the Kardashians were also known for paying to have the paparazzi come on vacation to shoot their family vacations and then providing those as exclusive images to uh, magazines where they would make deals, right? So it makes sense that she wants to claim that her and her family didn't actively engage with or work with the paparazzi because the very presence of paparazzi is strategically used to signify the importance of a celebrity. And the perception of fame involves in part this illusion that those who are famous don't want to be followed by paparazzi. So it's this very carefully curated routine that revolves around wealthy and predominantly white celebrities performing victimhood while precarious paparazzi photographers are cast as their aggressive and frightening perpetrators. And then the fact that the paparazzi in LA are predominantly Latino men who have historically been stereotyped as aggressive, macho, violent sexual predators makes it convenient to demonize them as a threat and a nuisance. And this last point is not unique to Kim, right? Many celebrities, especially white women celebrities, use the paparazzi for exposure while demonizing them. But for example, it's the same strategy that Donald Trump used uh, to become famous. And this is a quote from Trump's 2004 book, How to Get Rich. Um, and it illustrates this. He says, if I happen to be outside, I'm probably on one of my golf courses where I protect my hair from overexposure by wearing a golf hat. It's a way to avoid the paparazzi. Plus the hat always has a big Trump logo on it. It's automatic promotion. Right, so he references wanting to avoid the paps and then in the next sentence reveals how he uses them to promote his own brand. So it really highlights this hypocrisy. Similar to the Kardashians, Trump was not an actor or musician, but was famous for being famous. And like the Kardashians, he parlayed that into, you know, reality show stardom and now into a political career that the Kardashian West family is actively engaging with. And so it's not a surprise that we see the Trumps and the Kardashians uh, and Jenners using similar media strategy and collaborating for what amount to media opportunities, right? And their photos together shown here, um, ways we see Kim using her criminal justice efforts, Trump, annou Trump announcing his Supreme Court uh, nominee apprentice style on primetime TV earlier in his presidency. You know, both families critique the very media that give them constant coverage and build their brand. And again, this is part of the strategy. It's just, you know, Trump is using it from a very powerful political platform, but that's why this collaboration between Kim and Trump is so important because she is also now positioning herself strategically in the political realm, even if she wants to claim that she and Kanye aren't political. And of course, this isn't even to touch on the blatant appropriation that the Kardashians and Jenners engage with daily and profit off of daily. So the Kardashians and Jenner's various racist and political projects are highly consequential and influential. And so they have to be taken seriously. And so I look forward to talking about all of the issues that have been covered together um, here as we move into Q&A, giving any anecdotes from, from my celebrity reporting days and, and you know having a really dynamic conversation with um, the other panelists. So I will stop there. And I will stop sharing my screen as soon as I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> oh, there we go, sorry. <laughs> oh, I think somebody stopped it for me, great. Great, um, thank you all uh, for such brilliant and provocative thoughts. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, mini questions, um, and there's a lot of resonances, I think, across your, your different uh, papers, uh, and I encourage the audience to send in their questions as well. Um, so I'll be monitor monitoring the Q&A, um, and we'll have about 15-ish minutes to, to sort of chat with each other. Um, so my first question is actually going to be probably the, the sort of devil's advocate um, <laughs> question, which is to, to sort of talk about um, our own consumption of the Kardashians, right, and sort of spectatorial pleasure. So there's this tension, right, between the, in terms of how we understand them on television, uh, pleasure is derived from the moments of intimacy uh, and sort of authenticity that we sort of glean from them on television. Uh, 
coupled with knowing that everything is constructed, right? Everything is mediated. Um, and this is sort of where this, you know, question of pleasure and identification uh, and disidentification occur. So I'm wondering, is there anything that we can actually recuperate or gain from the Kardashians? Or is this enterprise um, completely sort of corrupt in terms of the ways in which uh, we sort of understand their, uh, the sort of material consequences of, of their fame and celebrity. And as you all rightly sort of point out, the, the sort of exploitation of, of uh, blackness uh, and black women in particular for, for their own uh, economic uh, and gain within an attention economy. Anybody wow. eager to? <laughs> or if you just hate them, that's fine too. But yeah, I'm just kind of. I'll, I'll say, <laughs> I'll just say a couple of quick things. Um, and thank you so much for everybody else's talks. They were so interesting. Um, and thank you, Brandy, for your question. I'll just say, I actually, even though I love reality television, not gonna lie, it's a, it's a guilt, not guilty pleasure. I've never been able to enjoy anything related to the Kardashians because I have seen through them and in relation to this what i just said seeing through them i that's why it was kind of important for me to give this talk that was very like deeply historical um as quickly as i could because i think part of the pleasure for at least some part of the u.s population and beyond i think is truly the um the lack of knowledge of just how long this history is of what they're doing and how they're very much like rent set in their talk as well. And, and um, Vanessa, well, actually all of us said this in some way that they are not necessarily innovating something as much as taking advantage of a, a way of marketing something that has existed for actual centuries. Um, but I think that a lot of the American public, especially maybe is not so aware of that. And I think that at least for some of their, the people who are not bothered by what they do, it might actually be diminished if they understood how nefarious it is and the imagery is. I'll just say that. Anyone else want to chime in? You're muted, I, Elizabeth. I, oh, Elizabeth, you're muted. Just, you. just super quickly. I mean, I think, you know, as far as reality TV shows go, the show is not, it's not a well done show. It's not like it literally, like there, it, it's not about anything. Um, and it's complete, it, it's completely script. And, you know, when I think about more high quality uh, reality shows that kind of deal with a similar population, I think that a lot of the Bravo shows, especially like the Real Housewife shows are done um, in a much more compelling way. So this is like to underscore the fact that um, that really the show's purpose is to build their brand um, and to shape the way that we, to, to, to establish and entrench um, uh, patriarchal um, cult and, and, and anti-Black cultural norms. Um, that seems to be what the show is doing. And in that sense, I, you know, like Deeksa, it's hard for me. It's not something that you, that you can, that I watch for pleasure. I, I also want to say, I think that there's a lot of tension too from the sort of celebrity media production side. I mentioned that, you know, People Magazine didn't want to put Kim on the cover, right? And in the halls of the magazine where they feature, you know, A-list celebrity photo shoots, you know, throughout the halls, they wouldn't put Kim Kardashian up. And so there was this fight there that I think had a lot to do with these sort of value judgments um, on their celebrity status. And and so I think that's where this tension comes up because obviously there's a long history of questions over kind of like what comes first, is it the producers or the consumers um, when it comes to media? And I think that, you know, that there's the, the reason why that tension is so important is because when it comes to today where you know all you have to do is look at ratings look at clicks um the producers have to respond to what people are clicking on and and, and watching and so you know it this was a moment where it really is about a demand like i do feel from the producer side there was resistance to kind of accepting the kardashians as mainstream celebrities 
And yet it was popular engagement with it, which had to do with all of these multiple layers of consumption um, and specifically the, the really exploitative um, you know, practices of the Kardashians that people like. And if you look, for example, at the comments on the Jimmy Kimmel video that Elizabeth showed the clip from, it's all Trump supporters who are basically like, oh, Kim's amazing, this is so incredible. Like their, their expansive appeal is, is something that media producers, regardless of where they stand, kind of couldn't fight against anymore. And I saw it, I was a part of it, right? Like I didn't ask her questions on the red carpet at first, but it came to a point where we didn't have a choice. I just, so I'm kind of um, scrolling through some of the questions in the Q and A and Brandy also just to respond to your question, but um, maybe to address a couple of things simultaneously. I, I, I see this uh, very clearly, but I'm really happy to double down <laughs> and, um, if I could do more than double down, I would um, on on the fact that I I see nothing at all um, to use sort of the language, whether it's of performance studies or whatever. I don't see anything recuperative or generative in their project at all. I want to be just unequivocally clear to to history, to to the gods, whatever. I think they're sinister. I think they are malevolent towards Black women in ways that are so carefully edited, so carefully curated. They're so good at obfuscating precisely the history that Dixa, some people are asking about examples of appropriation, but just to say a long time was spent on that at the beginning of the discussion. I don't know if we have time to go through them all again, but it, they exist in a history, not in a vacuum. Um, in various histories for that matter. And one thing that all of them have in common, it is not only the kind of shorthand of saying uh, slavery or th that they're all founded in slavery, they are founded in malevolence toward black women. So whether that is through the sign of the, the mulatresse as like literalized somehow like uh, mulata or Mulatres or mulata as just another word distorting black womanhood um, or, or taking the womanhood out of uh, black female gender if we want to follow Spillers's way of thinking. I just, I, I have to be honest and, and very clear that I, I see no ethical potential whatsoever in trying to recuperate anything from what they're doing. On the contrary, I think we, need to scrutinize them and scrutinize white womanhood as an apparatus in the US and also throughout Latin America and the Caribbean and think about how it has operated and uh, to use Elizabeth's term as another kind of handmaiden to the nefarious enterprise of rapacious white patriarchy, whether that form takes the form of a someone assigned male at birth or assigned woman at birth, I don't care. Um, so I, yeah, I just want to say I see. I think that if there's a reason to study them, it's to study um, how they obfuscate their uh, force. I'll call it, even though I do also think it's violence. But thank you so thank you so much all for for those thoughtful uh, re responses, and, and certainly we can have a conversation in the Q and A um, as well about this idea of you know hate watching, right, um, and how we can sort of potentially leverage our own you know status as as consumers, um, as viewers, right, to to sort of um, have a kind of affective relationship, right, to to the Kardashians as as a text, right, but also um, as as celebrity uh, figures with a lot of power. Um, and so we can continue that conversation. Um, one question that I see uh, that is for um, both Vanessa and Dixa is to sort of think about um, the connections between your two projects in terms of uh, Vanessa's outlining of how white celebrity gains prominence through acquired proximity and simultaneous demonization of Latino paparazzi in LA. And how might we think about that um, if that enmeshes with uh, Dixa's articulation of uh, the capitalization of mulata? Um, <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that there's overlaps kind of between all of these politics. It's these kind of larger political um, issues and projects that all kind of rest on various sort of layers of exploitation. Um, 
you know, I think the, I think it, this is a question, um, and I'm interested to see what uh, what Deeksa would think. But I feel like this is a question that really comes down to really nuanced kind of racial questions, um, because, you know, Deeksa is talking about these practices of sort of appropriation among people who would be uh, who who were or could be more white identified, and uh, the 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 Latinx paparazzi who I'm talking about are not. Um, and there's a there's a very particular, um, you know, it's it's predominantly, you know, very phenotypically marked uh, racially othered um, lower rank, you know, in the context of what I call the Hollywood industrial complex, sort of the lower ranked um, workers, laborers who uphold this celebrity system, um, who who ultimately, you know, are, are still kind of crafted as this problem um, when in fact they're elevating the brands of, of these different groups. So, um, so I'm, not, I'm not totally sure about like the exact overlap. I think there's certainly sort of some potential um, overlaps in the, in the kind of political dynamic, but um, I don't know, Deeksa, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think if anything, the question in juxtaposing our two talks if anything, to me, reminds me of something I kind of say all the time to my students and beyond, which is the sign of Latinx is, is it's shaped by incoherence. And so when you're talking about Latino paparazzi who are racialized in a certain way in their context, I'm talking about women who are undeniably white Latin American women in their context, right? Like they just are. Um, and so Latinidad, whatever that means, is just just like we're talking about, I was talking also about Black Latin American women, right? Um, and But I think that juxtaposing the two talks, I think that's what comes up for me is just how important place, time, and um, relationality with play, the players that are involved um, becomes really important to try to understand how Latino that comes is sort of arises in that occasion. Because what I was interested in and talking about was not Latinidad per se, rather U.S. popular ideas of what became stereotypical like Latin, right? Rather than like anything based on demographic reality or experiences, it was more the kind of mainstream popular idea of Latinidad as shaped greatly by these women. Um, so I think that's also an important distinction to make there that I wasn't talking about like something um, more materially definable than beyond popular culture in similar ways to the Kardashians, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Great. Um, so there's one question uh, from Grace who says, uh, they would love to hear more reflection on Kim Kardashian's work on criminal justice reform in relation to the recent mainstreaming of abolitionist vocabulary um, and Kim Kardashian sort of warping uh, the sort of Trump administration as her sort of president of reform uh, from appropriating aesthetics to appropriating movements toward liberation. And I also want to add on to that um, question about criminal justice reform, because what struck me, uh, Elizabeth, in your uh, video that you showed of Alice Marie Johnson uh, was that she, you know, makes this remark that she's not a ghost, right? Um, and she, you know, she's not a corpse. And so there's this kind of fascinating, and I want to bring up Ren's conversation as well um, about this status of the mother, right? The figure of the Black mother, um, these questions of the human, and the ways in which, you know, in that moment, it's almost as if Kim Kardashian, you know, becomes this sort of savior figure uh, for for Johnson, quite literally revitalizing her, right, um, bringing her back from the dead. Uh, it seems. Brenda, you froze there. I'm not sure. All right. Well, I'll, we get yeah, I'll, I'll just start talking um, until Brandy until Brandy comes back. That's a really um, that's a great question. And one of the things that I that I couldn't get into as much in the talk was just like how much, especially with the with the First Step Act, which um, which Kim has now kind of become part of that process. And and Alice Marie Johnson's story is like linked in with um, with the Trump administration's justice reform, which is which is less than a um, you know the Trump says that it's like the largest you know, criminal justice reform ever. It's more like a, it, it's a baby step. And there are some very important 
provisions in it in the sense that it actually can re it actually has um, and will reduce sentences of of um, of people who are incarcerated for certain crimes. So it sets up a hierarchy of um, of, of of criminal offense. Um, for I think like up to like 70 or, or so days early, which makes a humongous difference. But um, part of the like logic behind it and the logic behind um, Cut 50 and some of the other uh, justice reform organizations that, um, that, that, that Kim is working with is within a like neoliberal approach to reform that centers um, private industry and the private sector in uh, kind of being the managers of, um, of how this reform is allocated. So for instance, the, the, um, the criteria within the First Step Act to release people early is, um, is based on risk assessment, which as we know um, is incredibly racial, racially biased, these statistical tools, um, but, are, but tend to be run um, by private companies. So that, th this is all to say that you know, from Cut50, which, um, which is the organization that, um, that Kim interns for, they call her an intern as she's like working towards her law degree. Um, you know, she, the, 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 uh, her criminal justice reform politics are uh, very much in uh, con conflict with um, larger movements, long, uh, long articulated movements to abolish prisons, to abolish police, to divest, um, poli uh, divest from police departments, to defund them, to reinvest in community based programs. This is not what Kim's doing instead, um, very much like like the Trump administration and like the Obama administration, um, although we did, you know, witness more uh, really important legislation during the Obama administration with respect to reducing sentences. However, the approach has been um, clemency. The approach has been like plucking people up one by one, right, in the in the neoliberal project, um, rather than something that would be actually transformative. You know, Kim never, even when. Kim like laughs about women banging on the on the walls and when she went to the women's prison. There's never a question about um, and and as somebody who says I'm doing this for my children about the like how these institutions came to be and how they're wrapped up in a longer history of um, of oppression, of racial control, and of bondage. Um, you know, instead, this is very much this ends up being again like the use of it, plucking individuals up and the use of individuals to end up promoting to make it seem as though um, an administration that is deeply rooted in white supremacy um, is actually acting benevolently towards um, individuals of color, and that you know we should that he should be blessed for that, and that he and Kim are saviors to specifically the black community because of that work. Yeah, I, um, trying to read these questions, which are really keen. Thank you all. And um, keep in my head what Brandy was asking us, Elizabeth, before um, she metamorphosed elsewhere. But uh, I, um, In terms of the, like, I, I just, the, the, the questions about trying to find anything positive, because there are a few questions like this on the one hand, and then there are some questions saying, what if we center the viewership or imagine from the position of the viewership of black women and women of color? Um, and the one of the, the question askers evokes frustration and disgust um, uh, about Divya as the person's last name. Um, as the affects or the emotions that are experienced by certain women of color viewership. Um, I mean, I, I think if there's, I'm, and I'm, I'm positing that in, I don't know, I guess it is in opposition to the idea that there's something positive per se. I, I think maybe I'm just in a really bad mood and, um, and will be for the foreseeable future, whatever that even is. Um, and I just am not, I'm not interested in trying to repair anything on their terms. I, I really feel rather guided by um, uh, forces of destruction with regards to what they do. I mean, I think what Elizabeth was just outlining and I'm sure could talk in more detail about um, it, it aligns with something that I, I think, which is that 
I think they see, and, and in terms of the timing of the end of the show, DK, in quotations, um, their show never ends, my friends. It, will, it never ends. Uh, but the timing of the ending of it and then this shift into social social justice, it's just, it all, it's like it's more lucrative for them to make that to make that shift. Like, obviously, there's some new opportunity there in terms of using a discourse or misusing that discourse, distorting it in precisely the ways that they know how to distort imagery, distort history, et cetera. I mean, I, I am, uh, um, as Elizabeth is, a, a, a fan of Kanye West music. And so in terms of how I even came to the Kardashians, it's not because I'm interested in flat affected white girls. That's like not my jam. I came to them because of my history with Kanye, right? So that's been complicated for me to watch him and watch his pain in certain moments and his losses and specifically the loss of his mother, of this black matriarchal figure um, and where and how she died. I mean, how many plastic surgeries have these white women had? What kind of maintenance goes into uh, maintaining their bodies, which are, to my mind, a kind of plantation? They require so much labor, so much attention, so much capital to maintain, uh, so much control of, of their images circulation, their body circulation, all this stuff, you know. And meanwhile, where is Donda? There's a weird way that Alice Marie Johnson evoking herself as corpse and as ghost, for me conjures Donda. Uh, and it's not in some felicitous way. And sorry, I'm a lit scholar. This all just lately is getting too Hamlet-esque, but, and then we do have this other ghost in the form of a hologram who came to visit on unnamed island, which I'm sorry, anytime people say unnamed island who are from the US, I just, I'm like, what small key in the Caribbean are you just be shitting? Like, where are you? Uh, you're somewhere nameable and choosing not to say the name. Anyway, whatever. So Robert Kardashian appears. He's the ghost that's conjured, right? The patriarch is the ghost that's conjured and speaks. You can hear it if you pay it to, if you're, a, if you are a Kanye West, uh, whatever to call it at this point, I can't say fan anymore. Someone who used to listen to his music with sincerity and pleasure and who has had to disavow or sit uncomfortably with that pleasure, I think is probably what I do both. Um, I'm stuck, surprise. Whatever, that it's, there's some dynamic of, between Donda, Alice Marie Johnson and, and Robert Kardashian and the capacity to disappear and distort the meaning uh, the meanings and names and signs, the semiosis, as Dixa called it, of of of, of black women, um, that makes the res that makes the hologram possible. I don't mean the technology that does. I mean the bizarre psyche that gets off on seeing them play their little familial game, as though Robert Kardashian was some kind figure. Like, give me a break. I don't know. I mean, Vanessa could probably speak more to that. It just the romance around him is, I, it's just so disturbing. Really, I'm gonna. No, no, that, that that's so great. Hopefully, you saw you, you heard my question because that was also yeah. I was thinking about those resonances between Alice Marie Johnson and and Kardashian and, and whatnot. Um, great. So I I, I think we have uh, a few more minutes. Uh, I want to get in a couple more questions. Uh, so uh, a last question: Does Kardashian's racecraft and multiracial white supremacy have something to tell us about the limits of representation? Right, because I think that, that's sort of what we've kind of all been circulating around uh, in terms of the inadequacies, right, per, uh, perhaps of, of a particular kind of uh, image culture. Uh, and then what does their girl boss entrepreneurship say about racial capitalism? I mean, I think where there's to 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 channel David Marriott into this, which he I don't know that he would actually want to be channeled. Into, so I'm sorry, Professor Marriott, uh, and I've got to do it. I think where there's for where there's rep representation, there's some sort of force happening, and I think there. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this this last question that on the, that we have right now about racecraft and 
this, their multiracial white supremacy? What does it have to tell us about the limits of representation? They traffic in capture, may just be the briefest way to say it. They, they precisely traffic in smoothing out, softening the edges of the brutal anti-Black force of representation. So what are the limits? Once again, I think the limits, and sorry to speak in these shorthands, but I think the limits once again are about the, I don't know how to quantify it, just exponential ways in which anti-Blackness can be morphed or replasticized to use um, how Dixie evokes Akia Jackson's concept of plasticity into something else. Um, I don't know if Dixie wants to talk about representation or not. Yeah, I'll just say very, you articulated very well some of what I wanted to say. And just to reiterate, I think, and actually my work in general is more concerned with this, which is how do we, um, to kind of build on Simone Brown's amazing work on survey on how much whatever blackness has meant um, in the Atlantic world hemisphere and the Americas, et cetera, has been so connected to the level of surveillance. And so in a way represent the, sur the desire for sort of representations, whether celebrity or otherwise, kind of a bet that connection between being surveilled, being captured, and the violence against Blackness, right? That they're just so bound up together. And part of what I, um, in my presentation, was trying to articulate, articulate also is how almost impossible it is for women who are racialized as Black to escape some form of capture that becomes capital for someone else, or that, or that becomes artistic expression for someone else, where it remains in the realm of abject, abject labor or folklore or something that isn't given respect or capital. And in a white supremacist world, that's not to say that there's no value in other worlds, right? Um, and so what does representation mean when you could have that context in mind? That's why it's hard for me to ask a question I saw, which is, you know, what's a good positive representation and it's like, I don't know, because that's not the angle I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on how do we slip beyond these violent forms of surveillance that some people see as positive representation. And I honestly see as another way of, of capturing something that is mangled and rendered valueless for Black people and somehow turned into another form of anti-Blackness. Um, I'm going to chime in quickly and also tie in a couple of other questions that I that I saw in the mix that I think relate to this. You know, someone asked about my comments on the on the sex tape and sort of sexual agency of women, and someone else also asked about the question of appropriation. Like, give some examples of how the Kardashians appropriate, and I feel like this ties to what Brandy pointed out. You know, in the in the question about racial capital, and so you know, in terms of the the question around uh, the the gender and and sexual agency. I think again, this ties to racial capital. So this is another thing that comes up in Ren's piece. Is you know, um, Ren rightfully links the example of the ways that Jan Jackson's career suffered after the accidental breast reveal on the Super Bowl, but it had like no negative ramifications on Justin Timberlake's career. And so in this same way, you know, I, I think the question about the the sexual agency of someone like Kim Kardashian with the release of the sex tape, it has everything to do with her race. It has, if she had been a black woman, this wouldn't have happened. In the same way that their appropriation is, is viewed and valued in these particular ways because they're not black women. That's why, that is the racial capital. So when Kendall Jenner gets, you know, called having like new cool hairdo because she does baby hairs or when, you know, Kim Kardashian does braids in her hair and that's like, oh, look, Kim has this new hairstyle. No, it's direct appropriation. They're, they're recrafting their face, they're recrafting their bodies, but they're not black women. So that is the racial capital is that they're taking, they're, they're directly extracting, they are directly appropriating. And in the case of the, of the sex tape, 
it's it when I talk about the white women victim trope, it is the white women victim trope. Yes, Ray J, you know, says that that Chris was the one who released it, but the bottom line is there's a multi-million dollar contract that Kim signed. Um, and yet, even though she signed that, there was still this discussion about like that they didn't want it out there. Well, if they didn't want it out there, the company was very explicit. If there wasn't a permission to publish it, to release it as a porn video, which it was marketed porn video, the most downloaded porn video and viewed porn video in history, then it wouldn't be out there. So that is everything to me, everything having to do with, with racial capital. And in terms of the representation question, this, you know, to bring in my, my work on paparazzi, it, to me, it's like, yes, representation matters. And yet the limitations are very clear. We have paparazzi who are this really um, demonized, racialized demographic within the Hollywood industrial complex. And despite the fact that Hollywood is sort of constructed as this white space where in fact Latinidad is like the most underrepresented, there's this realm in which they are overrepresented, they are the dominant demographic, and they're demonized. They're demonized, they're brutalized, you know, paparazzi die on the job, they get assaulted on the job. So you can have all the representation you want, but racial capital is, that's the currency, right? That's what is making all of this go around. Yeah, I, 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 to I totally agree with, with everything that's been said. And I think that also sort of points to uh, to Sarah Jackson's um, earlier question uh, about the, the sort of exploitation of Black women's aesthetics uh, and how that might have influenced the, the sort of uptick of Black fishing uh, on and offline. And so I think that there's this, you know, the extraction, the Kardashian sort of extraction of, you know, material resources of Black women, aesthetics of Black women, uh, as well as time and energy, right, um, all ends up, you know, for this purpose of, of sort of, you know, this kind of, you know, even sort of passing discourse that we get, right, with Rachel Dolezal's of the world uh, and various academics um, <laughs> in the universe. Um, so I think that definitely is a sort of persistent practice that is not new to the Kardashians um, and has just been a legacy, right, throughout, throughout history. Are there any other questions? that folks have in our in our audience. We are going to stay on for around 10 more minutes or so. Uh, so if you have a question, please feel free to um, to put it in the in the Q&A. I'm curious, Vanessa, if you don't mind, uh, I'm curious this question about should we abolish celebrity? I'm kind of curious to hear how you, I don't know if you see this, oh. it's from an, an anonymous attendee. Is I celebrity <laughs> activism a paradox given their class status? Should should, should I think it celebrity should yeah, we abolish celebrity? There's a lot of good content in this Q and A. I've been trying to be present, you know, trying to be mindful, <laughs> not reading it all. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that in this particular moment, and also I just want to say, like, thanks to everyone who's hanging out here with us. What you know, what world are we living in? What's going on? Well, we're all here together. It's making me feel good. Um, but uh, but the it's question the about I felt since the election, I just have to say that. So thank thank you, my fellow panelists and everyone, and everyone who's out there for all the love because this is just it's great. Sorry. Yeah, it's really it's really important to remember. You know, we. Everyone's so disconnected. It's important to have these moments. And you know, the question of of, of celebrity class status and abolition. I think that I think that this is, is a very particular moment where these things do feel um, maybe more relevant than usual because since the beginning of the pandemic, there's been really extensive um, kind of. Um, discussion about the out of touchness of celebrities right earlier on in the pandemic we had you know Ellen DeGeneres comparing her broadcasting from her home her you know multi-million dollar palatial estate to she she actually equated it to being imprisoned I don't know if you remember this controversy, but she she literally was like, oh, I'm basically in prison. I'm here in this home. She talked about, you know, the fact that she's like living with lesbians and like all of these really inappropriate kind of um, gestures towards her state as a celebrity living in this palatial estate with her wife um, to being imprisoned in a woman's prison. I mean, that that's how out of touch and, and all of these different images from celebrities to the point that, you know, I mean, many, many sort of op-eds came out saying, you know, is celebrity culture dead? How can we be how can we sort of feel in touch in any way, right? The thing with celebrity is it's always about those who we're supposed to be able to relate to in certain ways, but they have status that we can't quite reach. And so it feels aspirational, but also kind of 
personal, right? That's why something like reality TV kind of develops those, those relationships. You feel like you're in these people's homes. But I feel like in this particular moment where, you know, people are suffering in these particular ways that celebrities simply can't relate to. I think that the question of, you know, breaking down the celebrity system, absolutely. I mean, it's, it is, you know, what I've been talking about with Elizabeth and other folks who I've discussed my book with, you know, we can't be talking about, you know, uh, structural reform or complete abolition and, and, and systemic uh, injustices and, and, and hierarchies and white supremacy and not look at Hollywood and the celebrity system and what I call the Hollywood industrial complex as this central place that historically has always been tied to the state and is always, I mean, it's it's no different than than thinking about law enforcement or any of the kind of government uh, organizations that are there to uphold and to promote white supremacy um, <clears throat> and and <clears throat> and class supremacy. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, I I I'm, I feel like that this is a really important thing to be thinking about. And also to add to that is all the stuff on, you know, there was the out of touchness at the beginning of the pandemic. And then there was the out of touchness with the uprisings and celebrity response to that. Many of you probably remember the I take responsibility campaign where, you know, this viral video of all these white actors saying, I take responsibility for racism. Centering just as Kim did in her video with Alice, centering it on themselves and their narratives. We don't care about your narrative. What do you have, to, what are you doing? You know, meanwhile, those are the same celebrities who are out, you know, who, you know, Kristen Bell is a major landlord in LA and she's on this video talking about, oh, you know, I take responsibility for racism. You're a landlord here in LA. And she's also one of the big advocates for anti-paparazzi legislation, which targets Latino laborers directly, not the corporations, the Latino laborers who are promoting her brand. So it's, it's, it's all this, it's such a show, right? It's such a show. And yeah, it needs to be broken down in all kinds of ways. I actually, I like this question. Well, I like many of these questions, but this one is salient here. And I would be so curious to hear what all of y'all think, which is the connect, I mean, especially Vanessa, of course, um, the whole question of bad press, uh, can we make fun of them? Thinking about the private, private island memes, or do we only uphold the brand? And I will add to that question, you know, it's like a monster. How do you, <laughs> it's almost like their association with Trump has somehow not tarnished them in the way that it has Kanye, which I find very interesting, right? It's almost like every time I read anything about it, not on purpose because somehow it lands on my computer and phone, whether I want it or not. Um, somehow I know that people often defend Kim and saying she's with this crazy unhinged MAGA man, right? And somehow they can perpetually are innocent when they're so obviously involved. Um, and I just wonder like how, how, <laughs> what is to be done? How do they get canceled? You know, if we even believe in canceling at all. It's, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I, you know, my research is on celebrity culture. I'm writing a book called Blackness in the Limelight. Uh, and I'm also thinking about, I'm also, I also do work in television studies uh, and film and media culture. So I think that, so I actually don't think that we can abolish celebrity. Um, I think we can divest from celebrity, uh, certain forms of attention uh, that we bring to it. Um, I think that the pandemic oddly sort of exposed a lot of the bankruptcy of this kind of celebrity in terms of people didn't have anywhere to go, right? So what were they doing? They were just sort of online, right? On social media, uh, saying stupid things or, you know, doing, you know, uh, stupid sort of promos, uh, you know, to say that we're all in this together in the pandemic and they're inside their palatial, you know. We are the uh, world video. Mansions, right? <laughs> uh, and, so, and so I think that that sort of revealed a kind of interesting sort of, that, that we already knew, uh, which was those kinds of class distinctions and questions of privilege. Um, I think that, again, the sort of the role of fantasy becomes really important in celebrity, uh, not just capitalism, but fantasy, right? And these projections that we have, um, we can talk about, you know, how, how do we cancel, you know, the Kardashians, but not Beyonce, right? Um, there are, you know, what exactly is the sort of distinctions between these two figures in terms of a kind of entrepreneurial ethos, neoliberal marketing of, you know, some version of feminism.
right? Uh, so I think that there's a tension and we always have to sort of na navigate and negotiate uh, that tension when we're encountering a celebrity um, and, and whatever form of activism they, they are choosing to take. Um, but I do think that we can laugh at them uh, and there is an affective and to whatever, you know, however much you want to place importance on affect, um, you know, because they're obviously still making money, again, from the sort of attention economy that we are continuing to make them viral, right, and circulate in certain ways. Um, so I think it's a really kind of, you know, tough uh, question to answer because we do, I, I, we do uphold the brand, right, and that's precisely why canceling, in my mind, doesn't exist, right. I'm wondering the, this person's question, and, and it may connect to um, what, what we were just discussing. Sorry, I just looked at the clock. Uh, from this person, Rachel Afi Quinn, who's asking about um, blackness, different mobilizations of blackness vis-a-vis -vis the Kardashians and or Kanye, um, uh, and uses the language of a manageable blackness, which to, to my mind is a paradox. That would, the idea of manageable blackness is, to my mind, something that would con, it, for it for, for the sign of blackness to be manageable would precisely require um, constant performances of. Uh, I mean, not. It's not blackness as rupture. It's as the it's like as the rupture that can be re somehow reincorporated when properly medicated, when hospitalized, when tranquilized. Whatever. Like I, I, I just find this term of manageable blackness to be interesting to think through. I don't know if other people want to talk about it, but whether vis a vis the Kardashians or um, Kanye, if we can separate them out at this point. We're not, we can go somewhere else. I'm just wondering, Elizabeth, actually, in terms of like, in the conversation about social justice, for example, if 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 the fray or if the terminology of a manageable blackness might actually have a, a specific register there. I don't know. I, I, I think I have to think about that for a little bit before uh before formulating anything that would be cohesive. Well, we're actually almost out of time. Um, there are still questions. So if panelists, if you want us just sort of, you know, type in an answer to, to a couple of them um, as, we, as we conclude. Um, we had a really robust conversation. And I think that it's, you know, it's really important to keep these conversations going, uh, especially now. Thanks for your, thanks for your attention. Uh, I want to thank everyone who made this happen. Uh, so our panelists, uh, Dixa, Ren, Elizabeth and Vanessa, uh, Dr. Deborah Williams, who's the director of special events at Annenberg, uh, and Andreas Scolari for assisting us with tech. Um, so if there's nothing else, uh, I guess I will just end it there since we're at the 1230 or 130 mark, um, wherever you are in the world. So be safe and have a good rest of your day.